Okay, so we're going to be on Luke 19. So I always go back and see what the connection is with the previous verses. In Luke 18, you had different approaches to Jesus. Remember the rich young ruler? And he comes and, you know, Jesus challenged him, why do you call me good? And he says, you know the commandments? And what was the rich young ruler's attitude? Hey, I kept all this. I'm good. So it was a little bit prideful in a lot of ways. And then Jesus finally says, give up everything, go sell everything, go feed the poor and come and follow me. And then he went away very sad. So that shows you a way not to approach Jesus. Now, just before that, actually, I should have gone back to verse 9. Because in verse 9, he told the parable of the Pharisee, okay, and the tax collector. Remember how they went to the temple to pray? He showed you a good approach and a bad approach. What was the Pharisee? Lord, I've done this. Lord, I did that. The tax collector stood at a distance, wouldn't even lift up his eyes, said, be merciful to me, a sinner. So he came to Jesus bankrupt. Then you had the rich young ruler right after that. I've kept all this stuff. So you see, on that parable of the religious leader and the um, tax gatherer in the parable, what happens? You have one that comes bankrupt, realizes it, asks for mercy. The other one is trying to get by on his merits. Now you have the rich young ruler. Which one do you think he's illustrating? Probably the religious leader, right? Look, Lord, I did all this. Now give up everything you have, is Jesus' response. And now you're going to have the example of blind Bartimaeus. Now, was he proud? No. How did he approach Jesus? Well, for one thing, he approached him the right way. It was he wouldn't shut up. He kept shouting. Everybody's like, be quiet. He just kept right on, right? He didn't worry about protocol or the nice manners that we have to have in church. He didn't mind calling out because he knew he needed Jesus. And then when he sees Jesus, he say, look, look what God did to me. You need to fix me. Or I've been, you know, the best blind person ever. Look at all the good deeds I did. No, what did he say? He said, have mercy on me. I want to receive my sight. And he called him son of David, which is titled the Messiah. So he approached him in the right protocol. Son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 38. And then because of that, he says, your faith has healed you. You can go your way. Now we're going to have another example. This starts off Luke 19 of a good approach. So we have a man that was blind, totally helpless, that approached Jesus the right way and he was healed. Now we're going to have the dreaded tax collector. Luke 19.1 He, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. Now Jericho is a very rich, affluent town. It was known as the city of palms. Okay, They would make like balm there, B-A-L-M, and the dates, you know, off of the trees there. And the Romans would export that worldwide. So it was a very prosperous and rich town at that time. And there was a man there who was called Zacchaeus. It means pure. So here's a tax collector. He's, in the eyes of the Jews, he's anything but pure. He was a turncoat, right? But he was not to the people around him, okay? Now, he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. So he was the head tax collector in that area of a very rich and prosperous place. There are three tax centers in all of Israel, and this is one of them. So because he was the chief one, he, was, he, had, he had the money. Now, verse 3, Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was, and was enabled because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he's a small little guy. And just the fact that he would even go out 
in the crowd was dangerous for him because he would get a little jab with an elbow, a little punch in the back, and maybe if there were some zealots there, had a little dagger, you know, and, and nobody's going to report somebody on that. This was the evil man of the whole region right there. So he was taking a risk. But you know what I think? You had the rich young ruler who came to Jesus all happy. Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit, you know, eternal life? Now you have Zacchaeus who's doing this at a cost. He had all the money, but you, you know what I think he realized? Is that the answer wasn't in money. If money makes you happy and that was the answer, he wouldn't have gone to see Jesus, would he? No. So he puts himself at great risk to go out to Jesus. And do you ever find that in life, that you finally get what you want? I mean, growing up and even to now, and you get all the material possessions, and it's like, what? yeah, what's the point, right? You get the new car. What's the point? What is the whole point? You get more stuff. You keep ordering from Amazon.com or whatever, and you get the new gadget. But then next week, you got to get something else, right? It, you, you're never satisfied. So Zacchaeus, I think, hit a turning point here. Now, verse 4, so he ran on ahead. So he ran ahead of the crowd and climbed up into the sycamore tree in order to see Jesus, for he was about to pass through that way. Now, there were, there were all kinds of laws, like you'd have sycamore trees, so many uh, yards outside of the city limit and all this other stuff. But they were, they had low branches, big thick leaves. They were places you could hide. So he probably wanted to be hidden at that point. Now, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for today I must stay at your house. Now, anytime you see Jesus and must in the same sentence, you better look carefully. Now, the first time that it occurs is here. This is Matthew 16, 21. From the time Jesus began to show the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. That's the first time it's mentioned in the New Testament, that word, the Greek word. Is that true? He must go to Jerusalem? Is that true? Well, if he doesn't go to Jerusalem, you're in your sins. You're going to hell. He had to go to Jerusalem to be crucified. So you see that he must go to Jerusalem. There's no ifs, ands about it. He was on his father's schedule. And so when he said, I must stay at your house, Zacchaeus, he wasn't saying, can I, or I should stay at your house, or may I? He was saying, I must. And the reason why is because there was an appointment made between Jesus and Zacchaeus back before the beginning of time. And I would say each one of you guys here have had an appointment with Jesus back at the beginning of, of time. And I know when I got saved, I had that appointment and probably many others. That's why he must go with Zacchaeus. And this will be a conversion experience. So here's this rich tax gatherer. And now what do you think the crowd thinking when Jesus, this guy everybody's gathering around, he's healing people, he's the Messiah, the Mashiach. He goes, I must stay at your house, Zacchaeus. What do you think they're thinking? Are they happy? Yeah, they're like, what? That guy? Why would you choose that guy? And it's very simple. His father made an appointment for him. Jesus said he was always about his father's business, and he always did the things that pleased his father. Now, remember, several chapters back, he starts a progression where he starts going to Jerusalem. And nothing's going to deter him from that, okay? Because he's got to be there for the Passover. Why? Well, for one thing, all Jewish males have to be in Jerusalem for three holidays a year. Okay, but this was obviously he had to be there because he was going to be crucified on that Passover that was coming up. So he's making his way there. But along the way, he has this appointment 
Now, verse um, 6, And he, Zacchaeus, hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, who's they? That's the crowd. They begin to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Now, you would never do that because you would become, in their eyes, defiled just by staying there. This guy was a wicked, wicked, evil sinner. And you're going to be his guest? Well, Jesus is going to tell us why in verse 10. And I'll, I'll go ahead and give a sneak preview. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Very simple. Was Zacchaeus lost? Yeah. Jesus seeks him out. He knew he had that appointment with him. And now he's going to save him. So that was his mission. Verse 8, Zacchaeus stopped. Now, after this, they said he has gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. Now, there's a little bit of time that passes here. It's kind of deceiving. It seems like he's telling them to come down, and then they're grumbling, and then before he comes down, Zacchaeus says this. But actually, Jesus has been with them probably for a while now. Then, in verse 8, Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. Okay? Four times as much. Now, according to the law, if you were, if you stole from someone violently and maybe hurt him, you had to give back four times the price. If there had been an ordinary robbery and the goods were not restored, double the value had to be replaced. And if you confessed it, you had to give back what you stole plus one fifth. So there was a penalty. God didn't like stealing. He didn't like stealing. So he took the highest level of the law against him. He said, I, I'll give back four times as much if he's defrauded anyone. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So he's a son of Abraham, meaning two things. There's the ethnic thing where he was obviously Jewish, Zacchaeus was. But then there's also what the Bible talks about. Those who are of faith are the true sons of Abraham. That's what the Apostle Paul said. So he's saying, yeah. He's a true son of Abraham. He's come to faith. He believes in me as the Messiah. So why can't I go to his house? Why can't I preach him? That's what we want, true sons of Abraham. Now let me ask you this. Are you guys sons and daughters of Abraham? Yeah. You're not Jewish. There's still a big difference you know, between ethnic Jews, which God still has a plan for, which is one of the big pushes today. God's done with Israel. You guys think God's done with Israel? No. Oh, no. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I can't stress that enough. There's a way to get rid of the Jews. And I'm going to kind of uh, paraphrase this. You know how you get rid of the Jews? You get rid of the moon and the sun and the stars. And then you can get rid of the Jews. Very simple. Why? Does Satan want to get rid of the Jews? It's because he's coming back to rescue the Jews. And he can't come back until the Jews say, Baruch Haba Bashem Adonai. Until they acknowledge him. Until they acknowledge the guilt, Hosea. And, and Jesus said, you will not see me again until you, said, Bless, until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They have to be there. Now, if... if Satan somehow eliminates them. They can't say that. And actually the plan of God is destroyed. So I, that's why he's so against the Jews. Plus in Zechariah it says that the Jews are the apple of God's eye. And whatever God loves, Satan hates. And so that, that's why there's this big backlash against the Jews. And even... Everything from the church replaces Israel, which is heresy, period. 
to, oh, those people over in Israel today, they're not real Jews. I first heard that from a pastor here in New Mexico about two years ago. Yeah, I did. He actually said that to me. Yeah, it's sad. It is just so sad. And then I found out that was one of the common arguments. Okay. And then, oh, my reply to that was, well, here, let's open the Bible and check it. You think you'd say, okay, show me, right? His reply was, no, no, we can't do that. That's not an argument. What do you mean you can't go to the Bible to find out? If you throw out the Bible, then I'm not even going to talk to you. Because then you have your opinion and I have my opinion. And mine is just as valid as yours and yours is just as valid as mine. Unless you have the word of God to arbitrate and tell you the truth, you just can't go around in circles. It's totally useless. Okay, I got off my, I'll get off my soapbox now. Verse 11. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Now, remember, he had his crowd around, he had his disciples. And so what were the, his disciples expecting? Even up to this time, even though he told them he had to go to Jerusalem to die, what were they expecting? Well, they knew he was the Messiah. So they were expecting him to bring in what? The kingdom. Right? What we would call the millennial kingdom, what they would know as the messianic kingdom. So they're getting nearer and nearer to Jerusalem, and they're thinking, okay, boys, this is it. We're going to start the kingdom. This is going to bring in the messianic kingdom, and we're going to get those thrones, and it's going to be good times. Uh, sometimes God's way is not as fast and not as painless as we would like it, right? Sometimes it's not. But is it for our good? Yeah, it sure is. It sure is. So this parable member has to pertain because they were near Jerusalem and they thought, okay, he's going to bring in the kingdom. So now in verse 12, he's going to tell this parable. Now, before I tell this parable, there was Herod. Remember Herod back in the days of Jesus ordered the babies killed? Anyways, he was near his death. And he wanted his son, first was Herod Antipas to be his, you know, his, um, the guy who succeeded him. But then he changed it to another son. Archelaus, actually after Herod died, went to another kingdom, went all the way to Rome, so that he could receive the kingdom back in Israel. But then the Jews sent a delegation after Archelaus, saying, we don't want this guy to be our king. So this parable might be based upon a true story as we read it. So Archelaus goes into another country, a distant country, Rome, to receive a kingdom back in Israel. But the Jews hated the Herods. It's like, no more of this. And they said, no, we don't want this man to rule over us. So here's this parable, verse 12. So he, Jesus said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then returned. And he called 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 uh, minas and said to them, do business with this until I come back. 10 slaves, 10 minas. So each one gets one minas, which is actually like a, it's a quite a bit of money. It's like a hundred days worth of wages for regular labor. Okay. So that was quite a bit. That was quite a bit. <clears throat> Verse 14, then his citizens then his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to rule over us. And when he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. So just as Jesus left this earth and went to a distant country to heaven to receive a kingdom, not in heaven, back here on earth, just like, you know, the original Archelaus, so that he could receive a kingdom here. He's entrusted to his servant a certain amount of minas. Well, now, now, what in the world can that be? To me, that's all the resources he gives you. Not just money. Time. Um, ability to work. Ability to talk and witness. All kinds of stuff, right? 
whatever resources you can use to further the kingdom of God. And now when he returned, now that would represent what? His second coming. Okay. After receiving the kingdom, because there he sets up his throne in Jerusalem in Matthew 25, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. So now he's going to hold them accountable. The first appeared saying, Master, your mina has made ten more minas more. Oh, okay. So he had one minas. He used all that resources, and now he got ten more. He somehow used the resources God gave him to increase the kingdom of God, which is equal to making it ten times, tenfold. Okay? And he said to him, Well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in very little things. You are to have authority over ten cities. Wow. So the reward is always proportional to your trust and to your labor. So if you had one mina and now it becomes ten minas, what do you get? Ten cities. And this is a funny during the millennial kingdom, you're going to have cities and stuff. Probably means you're going to have rule and authority over ten cities. Okay. The second came saying, your mina master has made five more minas. And he said to him also, you are to be over five cities. So one minas become five minas. And now he has five cities. Again, proportional. Now, as, we, as I go through the book of Daniel on Thursdays, they were tested. The uh, four Hebrew ch children were tested for ten days. Okay, not to eat the king's food and stuff that is unkosher. They got to eat just vegetables and water. And guess what Nebuchadnezzar found about them? They were ten times better. Tested ten days. They were found to be ten times better. Again, the reward matching exactly what you put into it. So God's going to be fair. I think that's the problem for some of us. <laughs> is that God's going to be fair? Okay, because we're going to find out. Okay? So God has not forgotten your work. I don't have to sit there and say, oh, God, I did this for you. I did that for you. No, I haven't done anything for God. He, What he does is he empowers me. He gives me the opportunity. And then he gives me credit. It's like, wow. Right? I mean, that, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Okay. Now, verse 19. No, verse 20. Another came saying, Master, your mina, which I put away in a handkerchief, I was afraid because you're an exacting man. You took up where you did not lay down and reap where you did not sow. Now, when he said exacting man, he meant very harsh. Okay? Man, you're a very harsh man. And you're just, you know, you, you went over here and you have slaves under you and you take up where you did not, you know, sow and you, you know, on and on. Then he said to him, by your own words, I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you know that I am an exacting man taken up where I did not lay down and reap him where I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. That's interesting. Now, how would I interpret that one, right? <laughs> well, I thought about that one. Everybody just kind of skips over this part. Okay. So I'll just do the same. So anyways, the next verse, no. <laughs> no, I won't. Well, think about it. Okay, God gives us all this time and resources. Now, if he's saying, now, if you're not going to use it yourself, the very least, now, what, what do you do when you put money in the bank? Either you invest it yourself, you do the studying, you find the right places to put it and get a return, right? So you have one mina and you get ten more minas. In the real world illustration. If you just give it to the bank, which I think is like money changer or money lender's table or something. I think literally the word's just table, our bench, from which we get the word bank. Okay. What, is he, what are you doing? You just entrust your resources to someone else. Do you do anything? No. Right? You just give it to the bank, and then you earn interest, right? Someone else utilizes your resources to what? To get a return, make money for you. So what he's saying here to me, at least, is this. He's saying, 
you know what, if you're not going to go out and use your resources, at least give some of your resources to someone else that they can use it. In the very least, I'll get a return. So in other words, maybe help that missionary overseas, missionary overseas, right? Let him preach the gospel. And then at least you'll get some interest off of that. And so he's saying, you could at least put it in the bank. Verse 24, then he said to the bystanders, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. And they said to him, master, he has 10 minas already. I tell you, to everyone who has, more shall be given. But from one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Ooh, punishment for going and burying all your resources God's given you and not using it. Which scares me to death. It should scare all of us, right? In other words, are you using all your resources to further the kingdom of God? To tell people about Jesus, are you? I'm not. Not fully like I should. And it makes me wonder, my God, am I bearing part of my the minas that you gave me? You know? And it's serious. It really is. I mean, I could easily say, well, nobody's perfect. Well, of course nobody's perfect. But I know that I want to be fully used by God. And I think for years I buried my minas. I really do. I know I did. And it took God smacking me, bam, right outside the head. Some pretty hard hits. At least from my point of view. Some pretty hard hits. And it kind of woke me up. It's like, God, okay, I'm ready. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. I don't care. He says in verse 26, I tell you, to everyone that has, more shall be given, but from the one that does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Now, in Matthew 13 and other places, that principle is used about common sense. To everyone that has, spiritual understanding, more shall be given. More spiritual understanding. He who does not have, excuse me, spiritual understanding, even what he does have, common sense, shall be taken away. It's a, it's a principle that applies across the board. So he's saying, if you just bury your resources, it's going to be taken away from you. Not only taken away from you, if you cross-reference Matthew 25, and it's actually a little bit different. But anyways, that servant was cut into pieces. Okay, so judgment, judgment. Now, verse 27, these enemies of mine who do not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. So when Jesus comes back, is there going to be retribution? Yes. We don't like to think about that. But it's true. You know, you don't want to make God, we talked about this at dinner, you don't want to make God nothing but a lovey-dovey, you know, ushy-gushy, you know, being, right? You don't want to make him that. Because then Hitler gets it. Stalin gets it. Where he killed millions of people. Where they destroyed millions of lives. And they didn't even have to repent. Okay? See, and I'm, I'm serious. And so you don't want that kind of God. He would not be a God who's righteous. That's why he sent his own son to die for us. So yeah, there is retribution coming. And I'll say for the 1,500,032nd time. Right now, Jesus can be your Savior. Once he comes back, he will be your judge. You don't want him to be your judge. Because then grace is out the door. It's just, what does the Word of God say? It's what does the Word of God say? Which is why it's so important for us to get out the Word now. Verse 28. After Jesus said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. Again, he's heading towards Jerusalem. He must see Zacchaeus. He must go to Jerusalem. When he approached Bethphage, Bethphage and Bethany near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you. There, as you enter, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever sat, untie it and bring it here. So right there's a miracle that he could even sit on that colt, right? Now, colt, don't be confused at the horse, okay? It just means the foal of a donkey, you know, the young one of a donkey, okay? That's all it means. 
Um, and I was confused about that for years. And if anyone asks, why are you in untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said to him, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and they threw their coats on it and put Jesus on it. And he was going and they were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as he's approaching near the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to, began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. I mean, can you imagine the joyous occasion? Oh my gosh. This was, as I recall, the 10th of Nisan. Now, why is that important? Because on the 14th of Nisan was Passover, on the 10th, you chose the Passover lamb, okay? And you inspected him for four days. So in a sense, this is typology. This is Jesus presenting himself to be inspected as the Passover lamb, okay? As you follow Passover and what he did, it all matches up. It's like, oh my gosh. But it gives me such, I don't know how to explain it, such satisfaction, such joy that God is a such control of everything. There's nothing that escapes. There's no detail. Sometimes you feel like God, that you forgot he put you in the oven and turned it up too high. Sometimes, you know, I, I know so if you guys are honest, you think you would think that, right? But the truth is, no. He's more of aware of that oven than you are. And he's got everything worked out. Okay, not that he enjoys that people squirm or anything like that. But you know what? We talked about this before. So many parables we see like one side, the temporal side, right? How could that happen? Lazarus and dives, Lazarus and the rich man. Look at that. You call that fair? Is there a guy of justice? He's out there feasting every day. This poor guy's being led, being set down at the, his gate, and he's not getting any of the crumbs. Is that fair? Well, we only see one side. Then we get to the other side of the curtain, right? When they both die, what do we see? We see Lazarus feasting in the bosom. Talk about the seating arrangement. In other words, he's right next to Abraham as a guest of honor. To the Jew, that was like, okay, you can't go higher than that. What happened to the rich man? He was in flames. Yeah. So... So sometimes we see things very short-sighted. So God deals with, with us in the eternity, with the eternity in mind. We want him to deal with us in the moment. But he doesn't do that always, right? So hang on. <laughs> Jesus is coming soon. Now, verse 38. Here's what the crowd was shouting. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, there's always these sourpuss religionists. Teacher, rebuke your disciple. Look at this. Blessed is he who comes, you know, in the name of the Lord, the king that comes in the name of the Lord. For one thing, they're claiming Messiahship for him. They can't have that. That goes against their religious program. And plus, this might be a bigger franchise than theirs. They don't want that. But Jesus said, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Do you guys think he was literal then? It says this in Romans 8, 20 through 22. For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that creation itself would be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Even creation was put under the curse. Okay. And even creation groans to be set free. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. I just know it does. In verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. So I do believe the stones would have cried out. Verse 41, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. Now, there's only two times in scripture when Jesus cried. Or we read about him crying. Anyone know? Only two times. Once in John 11. 
over the death of, I said his name earlier, but it was Lazarus. Okay. And here, when you look down at the city, so think of it this way. I thought about this. He wept the first time over the death of a friend, and he wept the second time over the death of a nation. So he had a heart. And when either one happened, and he saw all, he knew it was coming upon Jerusalem, and he's going to talk about it. He wept. Verse 42, saying, if he had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace. But now they had been hidden from your eyes. So he wept over that. He knew the horrendous things that would come upon the Jews. that we see it today. Verse, verse 43, for the days will come upon you. When your enemies are throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground, your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another because she did not recognize the time of your visitation. When did this happen? Anyone know? Judgment. It was judgment. Yeah, for sure. It was, in fact, it was a watermark. Not only Jewish history, I would say in all of human history, 70 AD. You hear me say that? That did a lot. 70 AD. Here's what happened. They revolted against Rome. The, the Romans came in and leveled the city, burned the temple to the ground. In fact, the gold dome on the temple melted between the stones. And the Romans, to get the gold out, took every stone off one off of another to get the gold. So he says not one stone will be left upon another. It was a literal. Okay? And he was crying about it. And from there, that was the Jews were scattered throughout the world for about 2,000 years. May 14th, 1948, they came back to Israel and were declared a nation. And this tiny little nation of refugees was attacked by all the nations around it they had armies they had pitchforks though the jews had pitchforks so let's make it fair so they had pitchforks and guess who won the jews now how is that possible how is that possible is that possible no that's impossible except for god it had to be God, period. So I don't care if every nation of the world comes against Jerusalem. Oh, excuse me, Zechariah 12, 14. All the nations of the world will be against Jerusalem. Guess who wins? It's not all the nations of the world. It's Jerusalem. For one very teeny tiny reason, that's because God's on their side. Okay? So... They did not recognize the time of their visitation. What was that visitation? Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, presenting himself as the Mashiach King, the Messiah King. They didn't recognize it. Now, should they have recognized it? Yeah. Yeah, and I'll tell you where. In Daniel 9, 24 through 27, Jesus gave the exact day when he added the prophecy of the day he would ride in Jerusalem. That's pretty accurate. That's pretty good. Especially since that was written some over 500 years earlier. No, excuse me. Yeah, about five, almost 600 years earlier, he wrote that. And he gave us the exact day Jesus was riding in Jerusalem. Now, now, that's a pretty good coincidence to me. Don't you guys think? I, I think so. I think it is. Um you know, people would say, well, the Bible's imprecise and it's full of things that you could plug in anywhere. You know what I'm saying? Make it say anything. Um, they haven't studied prophecy. They haven't studied. There's if, if you go in there with the right heart, it doesn't matter how critical you get with the scripture as far as tearing it apart, seeing what the truth is. You're just going to find more truth. That's all you're going to find. Okay? So, he says... You didn't recognize the day of your visitation. They should have been there on the street corners there in Jerusalem waiting and saying, this is the day the Messiah is going to come. Oh, look, there's a guy coming on a donkey. And everybody's saying, 
Blessed is the king that comes in the name of the Lord. Oh my gosh, they should have. But you know what got in their way? Religion. Religion. Isn't that it? Religion is Satan's greatest invention. It's just sad to me. Okay, so we're getting down closer. Verse 45. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling, saying to them, It is written, And my house should be a house of prayer, but you have made it a robber's den. He says in Isaiah 56, talking about all the nations coming to them, he said his house would be called a house of prayer. But by the time they get to Jeremiah, which was the Babylonian ca captivity, okay, he said that his house had become a robber's den where the leaders, the shepherds, who are supposed to be leading the sheep, were fleecing the flock. Instead of leading the sheep and laying down your life for the sheep like the good shepherd in, in John 10, they were fleecing the flock. And that's exactly what we have today because the last part of the church age is going to be about apostasy. Okay, and usually it's a mixed bag. All right? Because the whole loaf is leavened, like we talked about in Matthew 13. Okay, now verse 47. He was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him. There you go. In spite of all the evidence, all the healing and the writings, when the Messiah come, he will open the eyes of the blind. He's going to heal leprosy. It all happened. Okay. And he fulfilled scripture after scripture. And he finally said, no sign is going to be given this generation except for the sign of Jonah. And they even had the resurrection. And actually, the funny thing is, a lot of Pharisees converted that we know of after the resurrection. There was a Rabbi Shaul. Have you guys heard of him? Okay. Well, he was on his way to Damascus to put... Um, Christians in prison. He went out to kill them, put them in prison, and he saw a bright light one day, and he became the Apostle Paul. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Now, if there's any one Pharisee, if I knew the history, I would say, that's the one guy you're not going to convert, right? That's the guy that murders Christians. R Rabbi Shaul. And now he's known, and you know what Paul means? Paulus? Little. He took that name, Little, okay? And he became, oh my gosh, look at the Bible, how much of it he, he wrote, okay? Um, he became a great man of God. And so they were trying to destroy him, last verse, 48, and they could not find anything that they might do, for all the people were hanging on to every word he said. And we need to get back to that. We need to get back to hanging on every single word that we read in this Bible. We need to act like it's a lifeline. We need to treat the Word of God what it needs to be treated with. Our utmost attention and respect and affection. We really do. We really do. You know? We have time for everything except for reading the Word of God. Now, I put myself at the head of this, okay? I'm not trying to come down on anybody. I'm coming down on myself, okay? We need to get back to reading the Word of God and seeing what it says. So now um, we have Jesus there in Jerusalem, and we're going to have some confrontations there, and then we're going to have um, next week is uh, chapter 20, and then we're going to go to chapter 21, which is the Olivet Discourse. And that's going to be something. I'm going to go on that one. The Olivet Discourse. And we're going to find out a lot of things that are just about to happen. We live in biblical times. And I don't just mean every time is a biblical time. If you were alive during the time when Jesus was born and walking the earth, you would say, we're in biblical times, right? Makes sense. I'm telling you, there are more things happening now and being fulfilled now or about to be fulfilled than any other time in biblical history. 
Okay, we live in biblical times. 